So firstly, my name is Karen Redman, I'm the Mayor of the Town of Gawler and it's a privilege to be Mayor, it really, really is, it's quite humbling. Um, it hasn't been easy, I'll be honest with you. Uh, um, my talk is called Why Mayor? Uh, the role of Mayor of Gawler, the inside story and I will be giving you some inside information of my background, my family history and it might give you an idea of why I went for the mayoral role. Um, so my background is nurse practitioner in breast cancer care and I've been doing that for 22 years at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Before that I worked at the Lowell Mac and then before that I worked at Gawler Hospital and before that I trained at the Lowell Mac. So I was, I was a hospital trained nurse and I loved, love every minute of my career in nursing. I was the first breast cancer nurse practitioner in Australia. I wrote the rule book when it comes to breast cancer care for an advanced nursing role and I've shared that across Australia. I've been on boards, um, I've been on committees, I ran a journal club at the Queen Liz. I actually worked with Adrian Esterman, many of you would see him on TV and he was He's actually really hard work, let me tell you. Um, and he taught us, he would try to teach us statistical analysis and he failed miserably because we're practical people and we didn't really understand statistics. It's really difficult. So he thought he could get some PhD students out of our journal club. He got none. Um, but we loved working with him and he really helped us understand how to critically analyse things. Uh, he's a really, really good operator. So we were very lucky to meet Adrian. So um, I was working probably 70 to 80 hours a week at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. I was chairing a major uh, cancer group called the Breast Cancer Study Group, South Australian Breast Cancer Study Group. I was the first nurse to chair that. Um, all the other chairs had been senior surgeons, radiologists, oncologists. Uh, and so I was in pretty good company, uh, but it was getting really, really tiring and a girlfriend of mine who actually grew up in Gawler, her mother is Betty Robinson, some of you might know Geraldine, who's the daughter of Betty Robinson, um, and I, I worked with Geraldine for many years and she said you need to get a job closer to Gawler. And then, um, I thought I'd go along to a public meeting because Roseworthy was announced, 100,000 people. And I got this call uh, from, uh, it was an election, it was a state election, I got this cold call and Terry, Terry, my husband's in there, and he said, oh, you might want to speak to my wife. And um, this poor bugger on the other end of the phone, uh, he they were, they were redoing the um, expressway at the time, rebuilding the bridge over the railway line to Roseworthy, and the bridge itself didn't really allow for two rail lines. And I was appalled. They were going to put 100,000 people out at Roseworthy and not supply infrastructure. And so I really let him have it, poor bugger. And he said, he said to me, oh, gee, you, you're really articulate. That's, that's really surprising. And I said, you know what? People in the north, we actually can read and write. And, uh, and then, he, then he really apologised because I was really having a crack at him. Poor bug, I didn't know him from a bar of soap. And uh, then I decided to go to a public meeting that um, was in the Todd Street Hall as a result of the growth that was happening in Gawler. And Brian Tom was speaking, in fact. There were many people there. And I wrote a few things about the Roseworthy expansion, not very complimentary. And then I got a call a few weeks later, would you like to stand for council? And I went, I know nothing about local council. I know they collect my rubbish, that's about it. I, I didn't have a beef with council. And then I sort of thought about it and I thought, well, maybe that might be my spot. That might be where um, I could perhaps have a say about what's happening. I didn't know anything about local government. And uh, so that's when it started. And I thought of my girlfriend, Geraldine, and I thought, well, maybe this is what I need to do. So um, I, I 
got together with another nursing friend. She lived up on Gozard Street. And we got together and we put together a pamphlet. And um, I went down to Pocker's chemist and got a photograph taken. And, um, and that was my pamphlet. And I, I, I printed them at home. I didn't have anywhere near enough. I didn't know anything about running a campaign. But I, we actually run, a, run the pamphlet by her dad, who is, um, has been involved in local politics in the western suburbs for a long time. And so he gave us some really strong feedback, and so we changed it. And yeah, it was, it was a fairly basic little pamphlet that told a little bit about who I was, and I got elected. And the first time I went into the council, um, I remember the director of planning looked me up and down and looked, literally looked me up and down and said, who are you? And I said, my name's Karen Redman. He said, no, no, who are you? And I, I thought, what are you talking about? Um, yeah, so I didn't know what he was talking about. Um, but he didn't, they didn't know who I was. But people at Gorla knew who I was because they voted me in. So that started this journey of getting involved in Gawla again. Because um, I had been involved many, many years on sporting as a mum, getting involved with sporting clubs. Used to play sport here, went to school here. Um, yeah, um, I belonged to a family. And a little bit of my inside story is that my uncle, my dad's brother, he took on, sorry Matt, Matt Burnell, the candidate, for Spencer's here, he took on the train drivers' un union and won single-handedly. Uh, I can't remember what the issue was. He was a train driver. He used to drive the train from um, Adelaide to Kalgoorlie, the bread, the bread and butter train, or whatever it was called. Um, yeah, he was Des Willis was his name. He was a well-known train driver. He lived in Hamley Bridge, and um, he was my uncle, and he took them on and won. My cousin, who uh, his father is my father's brother, my cousin Chris Willis uh, was chief of staff for John Bannon during the State Bank era. He then became head of Channel 7 News. He was a journo. Then he went to Sydney and was head of Channel 7 News there till only about two years ago. Then he became Chief of Staff for the Leader of the Opposition. That particular fellow got into a bit of hot water, so Chris jumped ship again. And now he's head of Sky News, and that's my cousin. So, but the most important person who probably set me up to be tough and a little bit resilient was my mother. Now, my mother, Carita Willis, um, a good Catholic woman, although she would never call herself that. She um, was born and bred in Hamley Bridge. She was the first person in her family to reach year 11. She went to boarding school because she was so smart. Uh, she then met my father. They had four children. Um, but my mother was five foot nothing. And she took on every single priest that she came across and won. Now, I did feel a bit sorry for the priests, um, but she was strong and she usually brought up really important issues and they didn't always listen and they, I think they should have, but I observed all of that all the time. I watched her and I remember at school, she was on the committee at school, at our primary school, and she also uh, reported a nun who was taking tuck shop money from kids and sending it to the missions and that and she 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 called that out so she used to call stuff out she was so brave um yeah so she was she was a wonderful wonderful role model of mine five foot nothing didn't want to cross mum she didn't suffer forth but she she had an incredible social justice gene in her and i think that's the catholic tradition of strong social justice um, if you if you really take it seriously. So that's a little bit about my background, a bit of an inside story of the people that influenced me. And so I still 
I still contact Chris every now and again, although he is quite busy. Um, so I put my hand up, got into council, and I actually really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the debate. I enjoyed the re all the reading. I'd, I'd done a master's, so I knew about how to read and how to how to speed read, but how to take in the important information. So I knew all of that stuff. And um, then Brian Samble decided that he was going to retire. And there was an alternative mayor. And I thought, well, maybe I've got an outside chance of being mayor. At that point, we'd started a project called Gawler Connect. Some of you might recall that name. That's the Civic Centre project. And in 2012, we had a workshop uh, convened by elected members, but run by Denise Schumann, OAM. Now, Denise has been here and spoken before. Many of you would know Denise. She was quite important in that project. She got us inspired. There's a few people here in the room that were at that workshop. We were talking about the dilapidation of the Institute and Town Hall. We were talking about the Heritage Collection and we were talking about elections coming up and what were we were going to do. And we had an opportunity to get some money. And someone at that um, workshop said, oh, you only need a couple of million dollars and that'd be enough. And I thought, oh no, this is going to be a nightmare. And it was. It was an absolute nightmare. Um, but worth doing. Absolutely worth doing. So in 2012, we started a process set up a committee, I got on, I was a convener of the committee as an elected member and we were off and running. We had various uh, concept plans, we had uh, huge barriers in front of us. How were, we, how were we going to do this enormous project? Two very old buildings, one opened in 1870, the other in 1878. The town hall is lower, so they're different levels. So there was that problem, three-storey buildings, dilapidation, stonework, don't talk to me about stonework, it just, we had nightmares about the stonework. There was so much wrong with the building, there were pigeon roofs in each, in each roof, there were the um, World War I memorial um, veranda, uh, was so unsafe, it used to leak water, which was leaking into the basement, which was leaking into the reading room. There was white ant damage in the, in the reading room. There was white ant damage everywhere. Uh, and it was just so dilapidated. Um, we didn't really know where to start, but we did. And so off we went. And then the election was coming up and I thought, well, I might give it a crack and I'd like to continue. And I'd also like to lobby and see if we can get some money from the federal government or whoever would give us money. And um, I thought, well, that might, I might be able to do that. I didn't know if I'd get in. I didn't, it didn't bother me if I didn't get in, but I thought I needed to give it a crack. So that's why I went for mayor. I thought I had um, something to offer the people of Gawla. And so what I did, I had never run a campaign before. I got some good advice. And so I, I did two pamphlets. I had a communication strategy. I had a Facebook campaign. You had, as a female going, you have to have a wardrobe, you have to have your hair done, and you have to have your makeup done. And I'm not used to all of any of those things. I'm a nurse. I don't even have, I don't have nails. You're not allowed to have nails in nursing. Um, they fall off, because you're washing your hands all the time. So, um, so I thought, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to be the, one of those sort of beauty, beauty queens. So, yeah. So I put together this pamphlet, and I'm going to read out some of it. Um, so I had a few headings, and I had three words, intelligence, balance, and compassion. So intelligence, because I, I felt we needed some real intelligence to try and weave our way through and, get, and, and really get some stuff for Gorma. Balance, because I'm a very... I guess I'm a very grounded individual and I wanted people to see that I was balanced and not really a crackpot. Um, and compassion because of my cancer nursing background. Um, so they were, the, they were the three words that we came up with. So in my pamphlet I had justice and sustainability, independent representation, 
experience counts, tolerance and compassion, support equals confidence. And I had some promises. I didn't promise to get money, I didn't promise to build massive things, but I promised to be a particular kind of leader. So I promised, and this one I'm still working on, I'll be honest, I will listen more than I speak. When, I, when we came up with that, I went, oh God, I'm never going to be able to achieve that. I talk too much. I'm always talking. So I've, I've had to really learn to listen more than I speak. This one I thought I could deliver. Our community will come first, second and third. And I, I, I'm so passionate about community that I felt that I could deliver on that. I will be a strong, balanced and independent leader. And so I, I've worked very hard to try and be balanced. I'll bring vision to the mayoralty. I'll work with our council staff. I really felt... And I still believe that you can't get anywhere unless you work. Um, oh, my God, look what's going on there. Um, I, you can't get anywhere unless you collaborate and work with people and work as a team. So I put that in. But I'll work with our council staff to develop and implement a set of tightly focused policies to achieve the vision. Um, my merit will be marked by honesty, tolerance and compassion. Now, I'm way too honest for my own good. If people want my opinion, I'll give it but sometimes I should keep my mouth shut and listen more. So, um, so they were my promises. Attention to detail. And then I put in a little bit about my um, community involvement, which includes being on the Gawler Primary School uh, Council. Um, I've been a musician at the Gawler Catholic Parish for many, many years. In fact, I grew up, my parents um, met uh, in the hall at Hamley Bridge doing a pantomime. That's how they met. Um, I've been on the development assessment panel. Um, I, I've been a swimmer at the Gawler uh, Swimming Club, Gawler Amateur Swimming Club. I was on the Tennis Association as a rep uh, because my kids play tennis. I've coached netball. I've done all sorts of things with, as far as the kids go, which we all do as parents. So. And I've been a breast care nurse practitioner. I've been a, on, in senior advisory roles in public health. Um, I've got a master's in nursing science, etc. So um, I was on a national review committee on breast cancer treatment at one point. So um, I did that. Had to get a. I get. My, I got my girlfriend to take a photograph and do the, the hair and makeup because she really knew how to do that. And she took the photo. And then I did an endorsement one because apparently you need endorsements. And that was really hard because I, I just assumed people would want to endorse me. But I did get people like Michelle and Mario Collegia, um, Naomi Griffiths who runs Supercuts, Judy Gillett Ferguson, Barry and Betty Peter, um, and Betty's still here, Les and Judy Pierce. So people from really diverse backgrounds were happy to endorse me, which I felt really comforted and encouraged by. The campaign was really dirty. I don't know if people remember the campaign. Some of you will. I was talking to David Hughes, my deputy mayor, uh, who's here tonight, and it was really dirty. There was I was I was accused of being a puppet. In fact, there was an animated thing on Facebook with me as a puppet. There was um, I was accused of being a gang of four that controlled a council of eleven. Now, simple mathematics will tell you that four people don't control a council of 11. It's not possible. Um, and I also was accused of campaigning with Barry Nalon, who happened to be the treasurer of the Labor Party. So a little bit about Barry Nalon. Barry and my husband go back a long way, not because of politics, but because of astronomy. My husband is an expert astronomer. He, I, I'm still waiting for a, a picture of the Pallades, mind you. Hasn't happened yet. He's still trying to get it. <laughs> still trying to get it. His mate Steve, who is the captain of the Hamley Bridge CFS, and he's an, he's an ex-submariner. They've got their telescopes up at Stockport. That's another story. But Barry and Terry are astronomers. That's how I know Barry. I wasn't campaigning with Barry. Um, but that, that's the sort of thing that was being thrown around. I then complained, I, I was told I needed a stoush. I didn't want a stoush, I, I wasn't used to having stouches. However, when, when the puppet animated sort of 
a puppet was going around, I um, that was that really annoyed me because I I'm not a puppet. I might be a woman, but I can think and I can make decisions. And all the women in this room also can make decisions. And to say that because I was female, because I, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was doing and I couldn't make decisions, I had to be told what to do. It was really offensive, really, really offensive. And I thought, I'm going to complain. So that was the stash. I put in a complaint to the Electoral Commission of South Australia, who were useless, quite frankly. Uh, they sent me back. I put those three complaints. I wasn't, I wasn't campaigning. I wasn't a gang of four. I wasn't this. I wasn't that. I wasn't a, I wasn't a puppet. The only thing that he upheld was that four people can't control council. With the puppet, with me being controlled by other people, he said that's just a form of humour. And it, it's not. Why do we put it, why do we allow that to happen? Why do we think that's okay? It's not okay. So this man who is in charge of the Electoral Commission, he thought that was just humour. And so that didn't get up. But so the, the, my opponent had to make an apology and he buried the, the apology in a Facebook post. But the decision didn't come out until after everyone had voted. It took weeks, weeks. And you just thought, well, what's the point? But I'd had the stout and what I did, and the whole point of that was to show people that I could take on difficult challenges and I could stand up for what was right. And so that, I think, uh, was, was a good thing to do, even though it was really difficult. Um, but it also set me up for the mirrority <laughs> as time went on. So I got in on first preference votes, and then what we did uh, was really uh, embed the Gawler Connect project and really start lobbying people. We lobbied anyone who'd listened, and even if they didn't listen, we still lobbied them. Did presentations, refined. We put in one application uh, for a big grant. We got knocked back, and I think it was right that we got knocked back. We weren't ready, but we learnt a lot. Uh, and so we then put in another one once we were much better. And in 2015, I got a call from a senator in the middle of a council meeting, and we got $5.6 million, which was just amazing. And it meant we could do the project. So we did the project. It was a tough project, lots of hidden problems. However, now, and the, the vision was that and the, the name Gawler Connect, we changed it to the Civic Centre Project, but the name Gawler Connect... Oh, you're getting lots of different pictures up. That's good. Um, the name Gawler Connect was deliberately chosen to connect our new community with our old community, because we were growing and we knew we had challenges and we knew how we were going to manage all of this, these new people coming in and how would we bring them into our beautiful town and make them part of one community. So the term Gawler Connect was meant to do that. And this centre, this civic centre now, and I've, I've noticed that we've got Jacinta in the room who's um, a beneficiary of that project, uh, who's our cultural heritage officer. That, that, um, that business unit, that service of council gets nearly 20,000 visitors a year through the exhibitions through the research, through the, you know volunteers coming. We've had people from Cairns coming down. We've had people from Tassie coming up. Uh, everyone has a connection to Gawler. So our history is our point of difference and our history uh, is our future. So, uh, and it also uh, links into economic development. So the Civic Centre has uh, spaces. Some of you have been to performances there. Do you go to dinner beforehand? So you're actually injecting economic development into the main street if you're going to go to a, a, an event at the Civic Centre and those businesses gain from your spending. Um, the vibrancy that comes, we've got good quality toilets for the first time and people come and go all the time, they're just a delight to be used. Um, we've got the youth space, youth space is just going gangbusters uh, we've got incredible programs and it's, it's 
it's an, it's an exemplar of how to run a youth space. And we're doing that. Um, our innovation hub is full. We've got new businesses that are now ready to go out and some of them are buying other businesses. They're doing so well. Um, and so that it, it, it's just really interesting how when you inject confidence and some money into, the, into our town, we get it back tenfold. So that was the vision for that, that it would not only inject confidence into our, into our economic development, but it also would bring our new people in and they'd go, wow, look what this town has. We want to come and live here. We want to build our house here and, and bring our kids up in this town. And so that centre has a knock-on effect over and over and over again. So we did that project and we learnt a lot. At the same time, in 2010, uh, Minister Holloway of the previous government signed off on a ministerial DPA for Gawler East against the wishes of the Gawler community. Um, and from there, that DPA or development plan amendment, which ministers can do, they're allowed to do that, they've got a lot of power, um, the only piece of infrastructure that apparently needed to happen was a road. At the 1,000 lot trigger, it would trigger the building of a road, which is called the Gawler East Link Road. Over the next 10 years, um, there would be lots of argument about the route, where could we put it, which way would it go, what would it look like, etc, etc. It eventually got built uh, and now it's in place and there's more development happening across those Gawler East Hills and all those new people are coming to live in our town. As my girlfriend said, people have to live somewhere, Karen. Why don't they live here? So we need to embrace our development and bring those people in so that they feel welcomed into our community and are part of this community, and they will be, which is just a delight to see. Drake's is nearly finished up there. There'll be a few specialty shops. Mobile X, I'm sure you've all been up there. Some of you probably picked up a bit of coffee as you go past. I'm sure there'll be a coffee shop and a cafe up there. And I'm sure we'll all go up and see what the new Drake's, Drake's is like and whether we can get a special. So um, it's good for the people of Gawler East to have that. And uh, the childcare centre is already taking bookings. I think they've, they've got a waiting list already. So that tells you that all of these things are now needed. Um, so the Gawler East Link Road also was a great big challenge um, and we needed lots of resources. We needed to support our staff to uh, really advocate for Gawler to make sure we got what we needed. Um, and now it's functioning reasonably well, although people don't like the slow 50 kilometres an hour. They don't like that, but you know, we have advocated for state government. They're in charge of that. so. We'll continue to advocate. Um, so those two big projects, I guess, defined uh, the first and first and the second half of my second term. Um, and I think now our focus is is sport and rec. We need we need and uh, we had a meeting. I had a meeting at Carbethan this afternoon with Matt Burnell and Peter Brolman from the. Cup Ethan uh, Sporting Association, soccer clubs, baseball, softball. Um, we've got a master plan there. We've got a master plan at our showgrounds all the way along. They're our two big. Um, we're not ready to invest. We need to look at our debt levels. We need to manage our uh, finances to ensure that we can invest in big projects in the next five to ten years. So, um, but then we've got our master plans and. Matt's going to get us a heap of money, he, he said today. I, I heard him say it. <laughs> heap of money. So I, no, no pressure at all. Um, it's very difficult to get money. It is really, really hard. And so we continue. I go to Canberra every year and knock on doors and we set up meetings with different people. And um, we uh, sometimes we're successful. We... we um, we went, over, we went over and talked about our Evanston Gardens Community Centre and the, the system of payment 
and uh, we were able to save some money in that regard. We also, um, you know, with our Gorma Connect project, we actually advocated really, really strongly. It's um, getting harder and harder to find money, but we continue to talk and we uh, look at our priorities every year and see which ones we need to push and how many uh, um, appointments we can get with people. It's really, it, it, they don't treat local government very well at Parliament House, a bit like how they treat women in Parliament House. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a bubble, but you, you continue to try and find opportunities to um, uh, talk to people and hopefully they're respectful uh, back to you. So, yeah, so that that's really quite an interesting place at the moment and there is multiple elections coming up that we will be advocating for sport. Um, and I, one last thing. Part of my promise was to be compassionate and so currently um, I'm talking with my community safety officers who are just fantastic, one's an ex-cop, and they work with our homeless in Gorma. We've got a number of people, not a huge number, but we have a lot of people that come from outside that find Gorma very safe, which is a bit of an issue for us. And so we're working with our homeless people, with the Salvation Army, Darren Cox, and we're looking at ways we can support people. One of the ways that we've come up with that our homeless people are telling us that would be really helpful to them is lockers, putting their stuff in lockers and having it safe. Many of these people are transient, they come and they go. Sometimes they stay for a few months and then they move somewhere else. So we've done, we, we, we're working on that and we're working on hopefully putting up a motion to council to support a locker program. We're not sure where that might be yet. We need to work through the detail of that. But our homeless people are really excited about that. And I think that's something really compassionate that we can do to support um, Darren Cox, the Salvation Army, you care. We also want to um, bring together people as a loose uh, discussion group, including SAPOL, our NGOs, to have a discussion and work collaboratively to assist our homeless people or people doing it tough. That's a really exciting piece of work, in my view. Um, the other thing that we did the other night as a council was we, um, apart from setting up a heritage panel, a, an alternative panel for planning, that's a, a big body of work that we're advocating uh, in regard to getting community to have more of a say in planning, because they've been removed from the planning system, um, is putting up a motion to ask all to ask the local government association if they'd advocate for lockers, and so that every council can work with their NGOs and their local police, and see if lockers might be useful in other communities as well. So that it's not just the odd council in the north that takes the lion's share of homeless people. It's everybody. We need to spread the load because a really socially just community will look after their own, whether they're doing well or whether they're not doing so well. And so it's not somebody else's problem, it's all of ours problem. So we're putting that up uh, to a, a, a state committee, a state meeting coming up in April, and we're hoping that that might um, be supported. We'll wait and see how compassionate our other councils are. So that's the sort of thing that we're doing. Uh, it's really exciting to do stuff like this, to really try and help people. And um, we all have a role. My role is, to, I guess, to lobby and to try and make sense of things. And sometimes you get to have a say. Um, and I, I really, as I said, I really feel privileged to uh, be in this position. Uh, it, is, it is tiring at times, but... Um, when you go out and talk to people such as yourselves and when I go out to Carbethan and, and talk to people like Peter Broman, who's, you know, just a dad and, you know, he's, he's the president of the Carbethan Sporting Association, but he's just a dad, you know, just like the rest of us. But he's doing an amazing piece of work out there.
they've now got a really sustainable soccer club and they're really proud of their efforts and, and we're here to help in whatever way we can. So, that was the Gawler Connect branding at the time. We did this pencil drawing of the two buildings and I put that picture of the um, stonework because that was a goddamn nightmare. Um, there had been virtually no maintenance to those buildings for many, 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 many years. Uh, and this guy's fixing up the mortar and putting in ash because the original mortar had ash in it. Uh, lime mortar, absolutely beautiful piece of work. When you, if you ever get a chance when you go into the two buildings, the main piece of stonework was done on the institute. The town hall didn't really need too much, but when we dug out the basement, have a look at the stonework, it's exquisite. And you'll see the difference of stone and then the more regulated stone that's been hand chiselled as you, as you go up the walls. Uh, but that cost quite a lot of money. But it's worth doing because now it's ready for another 100 years. So um, we don't need to touch that stonework. Uh, and it, there, we, we're very, we're very um, protective of the stonework. We don't want too much stuff put on there because we don't want it to break. <laughs> Um, so, okay, right, do you want to go to the next slide? Can you do the next slide? Oh, there you go. So, the Civic Centre has won four awards. It won a State Architectural, Public Architecture Award. It won two um, Planning Awards. It won a Minister's Award, State Level, and the Best uh, Project uh, for the Night uh, in South Australia, which meant it went into the National PIA Awards, Planning Institute of Australia Awards, and we won, we won the President's Trophy nationally for our Civic Centre. It's just amazing, you know. They, they, loved, they loved the fact that we've embedded community into our Civic Centre, and we, we open every space up to our community, uh, which, which is really, really exciting. Um, and we most recently won a national board for our exhibition, Jacinta, which we're all very excited about. Uh, for a small, small, smallish exhibition, it won an, a national award. So I think it's something to really shout from the rooftops about, that just how, how excited, how exciting is it that we have this amazing centre that's been sitting waiting patiently for us to invest in it and to be proud of. And now we're exceptionally proud of our history. We're exceptionally proud of our new library. We're exceptionally proud of our cultural heritage centre, which is just kicking so many goals. The youth space that has so many, uh, it, it, it has a counselling room, it has a kitchen, it has a shower, it has uh, gaming spaces, it has capacity to do talks, and there's waiting lists for the, for the programs. The kids decide what programs they want. We don't decide, they do. It's their space. We have a really strong uh, youth committee. I, um, we beamed in by uh, teams today to some Department of Planning and Department of Transport officials with our youth. And I was just so proud of our youth. There was four youth members there. And they were just, and as we all know, how articulate our youth are, and we give them their voice, and we listen, uh, we don't dismiss them. And the comment back from one of the senior managers was, oh, you've got such articulate young people in Gorma. And I said, well, that's just the tip of the iceberg. They're all like that. You know, just come out to Gorma and I'll show you. Look how wonderful these young people are. They're fantastic. And uh, we, we, we we really got some outcomes. We've got some ongoing dialogue happening uh, around transport and around um, vehicle and getting getting your licence because that was ripped out of Gawler. You, you may not be aware, but young people need to get their licence to be able to get work. It goes without saying. That was ripped out of Gawler within three days. Nearly 700 kids from Xavier signed a petition within a week. Their parents were appalled, the kids were appalled, and they said, why would they do that? They couldn't understand why anyone would do that. And that was two years ago, so we're still fighting to get that back, but we seem to be able to get some 
uh, somebody to hear us today. So I'm hoping that we might get some change there. We'll see, see how we go. So we'll go to the next slide. So this, <laughs> that's me in um, Canberra, about to go in and slay a dragon. Um, but I'm, when you go to Canberra, you've got to go through all this security. So when you're outside, you look at the War Memorial down the other end and it's just a beautiful, beautiful picture. So I decided last year that I'd do video updates um, each day of what I was doing in Canberra on Facebook so people could see what their mayor was doing. So that was just a picture that I put up. Over there to, the, to your right is the old reading room and the two principals badge. We were looking at um, plans. We were about to start um, building and transforming the Civic Centre. Down here, you might recognise Denise Schumann. It's hard to see her, but she's to uh, your left, I think. Um, and we're in the middle of a project and we're looking at what we can, all the, what's going to happen and how exciting it really, really is. The other picture is part of our circular economy. We're now building roads with bitumen made of plastic. And that's Brown Street in Williston. So if you want to have a look at a plastic road, you know our soft plastic that we recycle? How, who recycles soft plastic? Oh, look, you're so good, you people. You really are. Um, oh, thank you. There we go. So that one. Yeah, that's Brown Street in Williston. Uh, and we're using some of our plastic that we recycle into bitumen, which is um, something that Downer, we got Downer uh, to do that. So that was, that was really, really, um, we might go, what have we got? What else have we got? Oh, go to the, go to the last slide, please. Thank you, Ian. Um, previous. Actually, go to the previous one before the Glorious Link Road. Keep going. Keep going back. That's it. So that's the Glorious Link Road. Um, that's been built, and all of that is going to be housing for one day. Yeah, I know. I know. It's... it's <laughs> It's, look, what are, what are we going to do, you know? Change happens, progress happens, and that, that was part of that ministerial DPA. Um, just go back one, Ian. So this, this was, I put this up because in the middle, this one here, Jim hits out. So Jim Fallalonga doesn't like the Civic Centre, and he, he campaigned against, he said it was a liability, um, I don't think it's a liability. I think it's been proven to not be a liability. Um, but it goes to show that we all have different views, and that's okay. And we need to bring people along the journey. Some of these issues that I've had to deal with, I had um, the link road unravelling. So th there you have Stephen Mulligan, who was Minister for Transport, and he once said about me that I needed to be whipped. Um, I think it was an off-the-record comment, but the, the journalist actually printed it, um, as journalists do. And I um, made a comment about how it's quite inappropriate to whip a woman. People don't do that anymore. Um, so that was the sort of thing that I had to... I didn't even know it, and I'd only met it once. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's the political landscape that we're in. Up here was a little project with Julie Tucker... And that's Dave Koshal. Um, Julie Tucker is a continence nurse at the Lyme McKeown. She lives in Gawler. She's married to Richard. Some of you might know Julie and Richard Tucker. Um, she's involved with Rotary Light. Richard is heavily involved with the lights that go on along the, uh, the South Barra River in Steve Clark's place. We put together a project to get continence bins in male toilets in Gawler, and we achieved that through putting up motions and we were talking to Rotary that night uh, about that project. We also had the Stouch, which was the War Memorial. Um, that had been going since World War I, I think, looking at all the, all the different Stouches over the years. And we finally uh, solved that with a 
Robert Hannaford uh, sculpture, which not everyone loves, but um, I, I really like it and uh, I know a lot of people that do. It is challenging at times, but I think when you sit in front of it, it is a beautiful reflective piece of a resting hand. And down here, I was awarded a Paul Harris Fellow with Grady Hart when he was the editor of The Bunyard um, by Jackie Addio, who was the president at the time. That's Brian Burt. Uh, Brian Burt's everywhere. Um, but I was really proud. I didn't know I was getting it, and it was just a really proud moment. And that was for all the work that we've done with those various projects that I talked about. So we might go forward and go to the last slide. We've talked about that one. So this is just an acknowledgement of who, another inside story. Um, my husband is here, so I thought I'd put a picture of him there. That's Terry. We're out. We're, we're out. We never go out. He's, he's sitting there shaking his head. Um, but he's a wonderful support for me. He's old Gawler. He's old Gawler. His family go back to the beginning of Gawler, so don't mess with my husband, all right? Um, he's related to the Brights and the Beadnalls. So his mother was a Beadnall. He lived just down the road at 61 Pound Street, didn't you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Knew all about the church bells. Used to sit up in the, in the trees and throw, what was it, stink bombs down on people? Sometimes. Yes, he used to he used to he used to do that and, and tentatively listen to people as they were planning break-ins, and I won't tell you which families they were, um, but I do know who they were. Um, so Terry knows all about Gorla, and he goes back to the Brights, the Beadnalls. Stan Beadnall, uh, his grandfather was clerk of the course. He was a bookkeeper. The Beadnalls were heavily involved with the Anglican Church, and they go right back. And like I said, they go right back to the beginning. Of Gawler, so yeah, I think it's something to be proud of to have that lineage. Up here is my brother Patrick, good Catholic name, Patrick. Um, his, fa his, his name isn't actually Patrick, it's Ambrose Patrick, but he goes by Patrick because he hates Ambrose, which is the family name. And so, very Irish Catholic. And we're at the South Gawler Football Club because he was in a premiership side, and we just thought we'd have a bit of fun and um, reminisce about, he was very proud to be in a premiership side because you don't do that very often. Um, that's a, oh it's still there. That's a video, over there is a video of just what I get up to. And that was in 2018. And I do that every year, just put together a few photographs and that's my family the same day. And in the middle, you may be surprised to know that's my mother. And she, she, that photo is taken outside the Prospect Catholic Church, of course the Catholic Church. And um, she's holding a Browning um, camera and uh, she's only, I think she's only about 17 there. Uh, and a uh, little powerhouse, five foot nothing, absolutely amazing woman. And I thought I'd celebrate her. So that's my talk. I hope I've given you an insight into the mayoral role and why I became mayor and some of the challenges. I haven't touched on some of the really big challenges around, you know, bad behaviour. I choose not to talk about that. I'd rather talk about positive things around Gawler. And so, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Questions. I'll, I'll take questions. That Martin, you have a question? No. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's got a question. I'll, I'll create one on the spot. Uh, <laughs> well done, Martin. I, I was actually in the civic centre this afternoon, uh, looking at the budgets from 1955, where the major topic of the year was the Rotary Club raising funds for the renovation of the Institute Building, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, sea green. I think it was the colour they chose. The facade and the, the lights of that. But what struck me then, compared to your recent experiences, seems to be the difference in funding. Where does funding come from for community projects? Back in '55, it was the Rotary Club, it was the Apex Club, it was many, many, many different businesses. Whereas nowadays it's 
it's, 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 it's state government, federal government, and it doesn't seem to be much beyond that. Is that, a, a, a fair that is that is fair. Uh, there's there's various grant programs. We we engaged a grant writer a few years ago to help us because there's so many grants. There's tiny grants. The big money's at the federal level, and that's why we knock on doors every year. Uh, and when we were campaigning to get um, money, there were uh, big like building better regions fund. They, you know they got two hundred million across Australia, 400 million. Um, they're getting harder and harder to get, and it's very political as well. So a lot of the money goes to Western Sydney. And I, I find it, I, I found it a real challenge initially because they don't, I, I don't think they always look at need. Um, I think that it's, you know, when you've got a safe seat, is it, is it harder to get money? I think it is. Now Matt's telling us something completely different, so no pressure with Matt again. Um, but it should be on growth. It should be, we've been earmarked for growth and that's not going to stop. We've had 2% growth for the last 10 years and that won't stop. We've got Roseweather, we've got Concordia coming online. Um, there's infield development. Now, you know, infield development is a dog's breakfast in my humble opinion. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of rules. People can get around the rules. It's messy. Uh, there's lots of disquiet across Adelaide around infield development. Um, so bringing in more people, we need facilities and it shouldn't just be up to the humble ratepayer to pay that. So um, they often want matching funding and so you need, to, you need to have your ducks lined up. We had to match that funding. Um, but we were... We, we lobbied exceptionally hard, but you also really need good, strong applications. We had development approval, we had concept designs, we had costings, we had prudential reports, we had a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of paper, a lot of time and effort to get that project up to a level where we thought we could win. When we did win, and that was that huge fund. So there's only one or two or three big, big funds across Australia. Once we got that money, somebody, some bright spark took Gawler out of the regional funding. And we were ineligible for about two years. I kept writing letters and we eventually, with the help of Nick Champion, we eventually got back in again because uh, they, they thought, well, Gawler's not regional, but we are. We are regional. And so uh, we're back in the pie for that money. Um, it isn't easy to get. You also need master plans and you also need to work with your regional development um, Australia groups and we're in regional development Australia, Barossa, Light, Malala and Gawler um, and that helps open the doors as well. So we used that uh, avenue. You talk to whoever you need to we lobbied people like Nick Champion. We lobbied our local member. We lobbied um, uh, senators. We knocked on multiple senators' doors to try and give them briefings so that they understood our project. We were told, if you get that money, I want to see people, I want to see bums on seats. That's what we were told. Um, so we did, we did modelling around how many jobs would be created if money was put in. If we brought people into um, into the institute for a show or an exhibition, we looked at evidence around. And the libraries of Australia have done some really good research around. If you go to a library, how much money do you spend? It used to be one. Um, you you spend a dollar, you get back five in your economic development. So it's about one to three now. So that was really important as well. So yes, you can go for all these big funds, but you really need to be prepared. So we're, we're looking at different projects now to get prepared and getting our numbers right, getting participants. So when we were talking with Matt today, we, um, we were saying, well, this is how many people are participating in soccer. This is how many people are, are participating in baseball. This is how many people, etc. And this is, if we invest this money, We've done some modelling to say, well, we, get, we will get more people as they come in and live in Gawler and participate 
this will hold us in good stead for the next 20 or 30 years. So that, that's the sort of work that you need to do. So the big money is in federal government. State government does have some money and sometimes you get lucky and you get both of them. We didn't get any state money for the civic centre development, um, but we did get federal money. So we're very grateful. Ian? You mentioned the Bednalls. Did that include Richard Bednall that was a teacher at Trinity? Bednall. 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 Yeah, B-E-A-D-N-A-L-L. -L. I think that's how he spelled his name. Um, he's not related to you, is he, Terry? Richard. Richard. No, I don't think there's a Richard, no. Mm -mm. No, there's not many Beatles around, is there? No. Um, there's, there's a few Redmonds around, yeah. Um, and the Brights, we don't know. I mean, you lose touch of some of these people. Yeah, um, because there were two, Terry's mother was a Beatnell, he, she had a sister and she had one brother, um, and they moved to Adelaide, your uncle Tom moved to Adelaide in what, 1921, two, something like that? Yeah. Mm. Um, Terry's auntie, his mother's sister, was Ducks of Bull Primary in the 30s, I think in the 30s, and she's on one of the, um, Kath Beatnell was her name. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's, there's. You can find them some in some places, but I don't know if there's any beetles here. Any other? Any other questions? Hello. Hi. Um, when you were referring to the Gawler East uh, Look Road, mm -hmm. and you were saying there's going to be houses all along there. Yes. In, yes. Uh, referring to that picture on the other side, what does council have planned for the remnants of the uh, disused quarry? Oh no, that's that, a nice sore. Well, that that's owned by the developer, and that's part of the Springwood development. Right, so they'll try and transform that into something nice, rather than just a horrible, ugly, It's it's a real challenge. That it's huge. I walk past. I do a walk along that road every week, and um, it's a huge hole, and uh, they they threw a lot of tailings in the bottom of it. So it needs, a, it needs a lot of work. So um, there's been various uh, proposals put forward around how to repatriate, etc. But I think, I think it's going to be a real challenge for anybody. Um, and I'd, I'd like to think the council won't take it on until it is repatriated. Because I, I, I hate to think how much it would cost the council to do that. So I think it is the role of the developer and it is owned by them currently. So I would certainly not support taking it on until it's repatriated, whether it be just fixing up the, the cliff faces and making them safe. But you also need to have stable ground, which there isn't, I don't believe. David, you know a little bit about the quarry. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? It's a real challenge. Yeah, unfortunately, um, it should have been, the, the mining company should, should actually have been made to, as you say, be repatriated or rehabilitated and take it back to its natural form, which under the Mining Act they, they should really do. Mm. But somehow the developers are saying they don't have to do that. Yeah, so I'm sure there'll be a future argument that'll be on the front page of the Bunyip at some point around that. Um, but I, I don't think it should be up to council to fix it because it was created by a mining company and they made money out of that and they handed it over to a developer who we've had, we've now got the third developer there. Do you know uh, if it's mine there? Because I'm not a, a gawler, I only moved into Sandy Lone, wasn't it? Was it Sandy Lone? I used to go down Carlton Road. I, I lived on Carlton Road. I grew up on Carlton Road. And those trucks used to go by all the time. I don't know if people remember those trucks. Um, Sandy Lone, wasn't it, David? Was it Sandy Lone or was it, is it, you're not sure? What was that? It wasn't that quarry. It was further out. Yeah. Um, that was before my time, what they mined. Um, yeah, I'd have to take that on notice, I think. I don't, I don't quite know. I'm just curious because I'm not a local born and Yeah, yeah. 
No, I know they took a lot of, it's huge. Mm. Yeah, lots of dirt and yeah, a huge hole. They were going to put, a, a, you know, an oval and school and a whole range of things, but I think that was a bit pie in, pie in the sky stuff. I think, you know, looking at the hole, you, you really could only make it um, some sort of natural walking trail, but you'd have to make it safe because it's not stable ground down the bottom. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of tailings elsewhere in that development that they're digging out and putting in new soil. There's a lot of work going up, a lot of earthwork going up there to try and, um, you know, uh, make it safe. Mm. Yeah, so it's an interesting, it's a very challenging site. Yeah, mm. I don't know if Minister Holloway really looked at the site when he signed off on that DPA, well, I just but... Hope it doesn't become a tip. There's a lot of disused quarries that are becoming tips. Yeah, I... I don't think so. We, the, the EPA isn't approving any more landfill sites. They're, they're very hesitant in approving more landfill sites. So they're, they're moving away from that and trying to get people to recycle or you know have alternative ways of dealing with waste rather than putting them in landfills. So I, I, I don't think that would be palatable. And if you look at Kapunda, Kapunda's got a mine site and they've turned it into a walking trail and that, that's actually been quite successful. So there is there is possibilities around how you make that a an interesting sort of site. But yeah, they haven't really started on that. But there's the I think thinking outside the square and thinking it as David said, you know, taking it back to a natural landscape is probably the best option for that. And it could it could be quite an interesting site then. Um, but yeah, it, it's not without challenge. Any other questions? How are you? Is there a dance floor in the um, Civic Centre? Hmm. Um, because what used to be was in uh, The floor was replaced because it was unstable. It didn't hold enough people, so it's got a cement. Each floor has a cement floor. The only floor that's wooden is the Heritage Gallery, which was the old council chamber and the reading room. They're both original floors. The rest, um, and the institute floor, is now a, a solid cement floor. Because it didn't used to be. No. And that was done up uh, yeah. several years ago. Not that many years ago. It was. And yeah. we weren't allowed to do the Mexican hat dance. Well, <laughs> no. There was, there's load limits, there's load limits, there were load limits and if, what you didn't know was the, the library floor was um, held up by poles, you know those joists that, where you hold things up, there was half a dozen or probably a dozen, were there Helen, holding that floor up because of the load of the books. Um, that's what sort of, when we went down to the basement and they were, they were holding the floor up and that was the engineering solution at the time was to do that, a bit like what they did with the Victor Harbour Causeway. They had, they had those joists holding the floor up. So we've solved that problem with cement floors, um, which means it's now safe. The balcony, you know the balcony of the Institute, that was so unstable. Water used to go down in between it and there was damage, water damage to the reading room, water damage to the basement and it was wet permanently because it was just pouring down. The, um, they had sand, they didn't actually have any proper structure to hold that balcony up. So every time you went out there you risked falling through it. And when Badge started to look they, they were horrified at how unsafe it was. So that's all been fixed up and it's now got a load, a loading on it up to current standards. It was all this work that needed to be done that we, we didn't really appreciate because, you know, people would throw things up and they go, oh, yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll work, that's good, um, but it didn't really last the distance. So, yeah, so it's much safer. You can, you can jump on that now. And you could probably put, a, you know, a floor on there and dance on it in the Institute now very safely. Yeah. Most institutes had a dance floor. You know, yeah. When I went through it, I, I didn't see one. I was like, oh. 
Yeah, so that floor, that floor was removed and we've got a cement floor, but you could, you could put, bring in a dance floor if you wanted to dance. Um, we're not allowed to dance, are we, at the moment? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Tried and tested the old floor. I remember going to balls where there were 600 of us. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I've seen those photographs. <laughs> we didn't break it. Uh, we all jumped together, bang. How nice. I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> we're probably a bit heavier now, Alan, you know? <laughs> probably a bit heavier. <laughs> Josie? Yes. And you would all, everybody would go, whoosh! <laughs> yes. Run and eat the food. But this thing on the side, it was just so unstable. <laughs> but it was used just about every week. Well, it was just yeah, the highest we yeah. hold. Yeah. yeah. People, people stopped using the Institute because there were other centres that were air conditioned and it was just more comfortable. And people stopped using and stopped hiring the Institute. It became um, a bit of a liability because people just didn't want to use it anymore and there were better facilities. So we either backed the Institute and backed the buildings or we, or we didn't. But it wasn't very um, old person friendly to get up all those steps. Yes, so now we've got two lifts. We've got one at the back, one at the front. Um, and yeah, that that's that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> um, but we've but we've also got toilets on every floor, even in the lower ground floor. We've got plenty now. And we, when the architects put the plans up, we actually added an extra toilet because we were worried we wouldn't have enough. Remember that Di? Di was there during that process. Um, yeah, so. We've now got some beautiful toilets, we've got a baby changing area. We won an award from the Nursing Mothers Breastfeeding Association for the way we've structured and got those facilities properly now, uh, you know, in a modern sense of what our modern families want. So uh, we needed to do that because I'll tell you what, those toilets that were at the front of that town hall, remember that tiny little, it was awful, it's just horrid. Um, there's still <laughs> In the, in the town hall, you can still see, because they actually had a urinal impregnated into the stone, um, and they took it out and left a hole. You can actually see where it was. So if you go into the foyer, that was where the, where the male urinal was, and they just shoved it into the stone. Um, yeah, there was all sorts of things done. Anyway, it's just a little bit of a, yeah, probably didn't need to mention that, but yeah. <laughs> So we can't, we can't use it anymore. Can't use it anymore, sorry Ian. No. It's halfway up the wall. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Different, different time, you did different things, didn't you? You know, now we need to do things differently. So um, yeah, it, big project, but I think it was worthwhile. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's something we can all be proud of, you know. And I think having those memories of being in the Institute, and that was one of our discussions, was do we keep the Institute the same? Or do we change and really carve it up? And the decision, I think, was a really good one to leave it as our main hall because it, it's, there's so much history around it. We took, we took the, um, the old stage out because we couldn't use it anyway. It was, it was not fit and it was unsafe. So that was a bit of a challenge to take that out. But we've, we've now got um, a really big council chamber area and a much bigger... Uh, community space. Actually, do you want to go back to the nearly the beginning of that slide? And I'm going to show you a picture of the community space of the old council gallery, and just go right back to the beginning. That picture there is a picture of the old gallery. And Helen, can you see those beautiful big screens? Aren't they gorgeous? Those ugly screens that were. Can, brought in. You couldn't, oh, that was my first meeting as mayor and in that 
Di, you're in that picture, Di Fraser. <laughs> um, Margaret, Margaret Crine's in that picture, Paul Kosh, uh, Bruce Eastick's in that picture. Um, and there's four nurses that came down from the western suburbs to support me um, in that picture as well. And Richard Wanderlick, who was the project officer of Gawler Connect, his nose is in the picture right there. Um, yeah, but look how, look how small it is. It was tiny, it was really cramped. It had so much history, that room. It was a beautiful room, but it was so cramped, and now we've got so much more room. And we've created, we've created one, two, we've created four spaces on that first floor. We've still got the hall. We've got a swing space, which is our community gallery. We've got the um, council chamber, which is in fact a, a flexible space. We have meetings, we have workshops. People can hire that space. And we've also got the James Martin Room, which was the original um, uh, museum in Gawler. Well, it started at the Oldfield Hall and then went there. Um, and so we called that the James Martin Room, which is a beautiful space for meetings. I do my citizenship ceremonies there, uh, and it has an incredible collection of McCormacks around the walls, which are, are just stunning, stunning portraits. So, um, yeah, it, uh, it, it, we've gone from that, which everyone's on top of each other. We wouldn't be able to do that in COVID now, would we? No. Uh, and now we've got plenty of space, so yeah, we've created lots of spaces because we created doors, created a landing uh, along that first floor and we, we opened doors, we, we created doors so that we could utilise that space instead of it being a bit of a liability. And so now you can get up there via a lift instead of stairs. And so that's created access for people. It's air conditioned so that it's more comfortable. Um, yeah, and, and we've also celebrated the beautiful windows, which used to have black all over them, because it used to be cinema, didn't it? So um, that we took all that down, cleaned the windows, cleaned the glass, and we've got these beautiful, gorgeous windows that now we can see, we can see the stonework fixed up, gorgeous. So yeah, it, it's not a liability anymore, which I think is something, again, to be proud of. Anyway, I've talked enough. I'm supposed to be listening, not talking. Anyway, I think that's enough. Any more questions? Thanks, everyone. Okay, now from a room full of very strong women, and I do like that, and I think Karen's put that across, and it is still very much male-oriented world, as we know. Um, but it is gradually changing, but uh, yeah, I think incrementally. So again, from a room full of very strong women, I would like one of those, young Helen Wilmore, to come up to do the vote of thanks. Okay, thanks Helen. Thank you, Paul. Karen, could you come back, maybe slightly socially distanced? <laughs> uh, it is a pleasure to be here um, with Karen and also, yes, to be seeing women um, doing far more roles than they used to. Um, I particularly liked how Karen started with talking about her family and her, her background in the early years, how many of her family members seem to um, have risen to prominence in some way by putting themselves forward and doing things, um, particularly how her mother was a very strong woman and influenced her and how you, Karen, watched what she was doing. The fact that, that you cared, you could see the injustice that she saw and you were watching and taking all of that in. And then of course you have your career in nursing where you've not you've been a nurse in terms of showing compassion and doing the job, but also being on many boards, doing a master's degree, being out there taking on roles that nurses haven't done before. And you can say that all of that led to you becoming mayor. I, I think it's it's in you to you you see a role that you can do, and you see something needs doing, and and you've put yourself into that. Um, you've also told us tonight about how you use your intelligence, and that's quite clear, and the balance, and the compassion, and you certainly listen. You oh, you've been. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I've got the microphone right now. But <laughs> Um, but but you're, you're seeing lots of issues out there, 
think injustices, things that are quite stupid that should be done better. There are young people out there who have a voice that you're listening to. Also our history, buildings, developments, a whole range of things that um, you've put yourself into. Um, so thank you. Thank, uh, and thank you for speaking as well. It takes somebody to listen, but then you need to go out as you do and speak and tell everybody else about what's happening in our town, in our, in our community, and how we want to make it better. And you've done that, and you've shown that very well tonight. Um, so with Paul's help, um, we'd all like to thank you formally um, for coming tonight and giving us a very entertaining talk. Thank you very much.